Welcome to episode 302 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger of at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Henry Alex Rubin, who made a name for himself with the documentary Murder Ball. He just wrote and directed a new film called Semper Fi, which we'll be discussing today. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 302. I continually build out the SYS screenplay library. I want to just give a shout out and a big thanks to Alex Stu. He just sent in a bunch of scripts um, that we posted. He sent in Arrival, Before Midnight, Captain Fantastic, Hidden Figures, Inherent Vice, Lock, Looper, Mud, Prisoners, Silent, Spring Breakers, The Guest, and Wild. So big thanks to you, Alex, um, for sending those in. They have been placed in the SYS script library. We've got hundreds of screenplays and teleplays already in the library. It's completely free. All the scripts are in PDF format, so you can download and read them on whatever device you use. If you have a screenplay that you do not see listed in the script library, please do email them to me. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library to check that out. I occasionally also get requests for specific scripts. So if you're looking for something specific, um, you know, and you can't find it, feel free to email me that as well. And I can kind of put out my um, feelers and see if we can find We can track down those, those scripts that um, maybe are harder to find as well. So again, if you want to check out the SYS script library, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing writer-director Henry Alex Rubin. Here is the interview. Welcome, Henry, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? I am half French and uh, my mother's French and my father is, is American. My mother teaches... Uh, she teaches French and to, to young kids. And my father is an art historian who, um, who, who, who has been teaching at Cooper Union and SUNY Stony Brook um, for a long time. And so um, I, uh, uh, sort of a, a, a duality, I'm half European, half American. But um, when it comes to uh, at the entertainment industry, I guess I never really thought of it as that because I started in documentaries, which is, which is more like the uh, um, the intellectual, I suppose, the intellectual non money making side of the entertainment business. I fell in love with making documentaries uh, when I when I was um, uh, at Columbia uh, as a student. I took a class on documentaries, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I uh, I just uh, I fell in love with a movie called uh, the Thin Thin Blue Line by. Uh, I'd never seen a movie. Uh, that that was that riveting, and also used elements of you know, fictional filmmaking in, in it. Um, so I, that sent me spinning. And for a few years, I just made documentaries, um, and I I was determined that uh, that documentaries were the highest form of, of filmmaking that you could you could do. Um, I eventually, um, at Columbia, I, I met a guy named James Mangold, who was, who was a very successful director, made every, a bunch of movies, Heavy, this is his first film, Copland, which I worked on, Girl Interrupted, which I worked on, 310 to Yuma, uh, he did Logan, and recently now he has uh, Ford versus Ferrari, and, and Jim was very encouraging, and always, Jim Mangold was always very encouraging, and always told me, you know, you should branch out and, and make fiction, um, not just documentaries. You know, you don't want to st stay a, a, an obscure intellectual for the rest of your life. 
<laughs> so, yeah. I, so, so I eventually talk, tried my hand at it, yeah. Let's talk briefly just about Murder Ball um, for a moment. Th this was, and I think it's interesting kind of getting your perspective because this was a big documentary hit. Um, and maybe you can talk through that process. I'm always curious, how did that film get distribution? Did you enter it into festivals? You found a distributor? Did you just cold call some distributors? Maybe just talk about that just briefly. Sure. Um, so so that, that I'd had a connection to Cinetic Media, which was John Sloss's company. Um, and he, there was a guy there named Micah Green. And those guys had helped me with uh, my documentaries, Who is Henry Jaglum, and also my documentary uh, called Freestyle. And so when I needed money to make um, uh, Murder Ball, uh, my partner Dana and I went to and you help us and they said make a trailer make a, a two-minute trailer so that's how we got the funding for murder ball we we shot a little bit on our own dime cut a two-minute trailer together and 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 uh, based on the back back of the strength of those two minutes we got a couple hundred thousand dollars to complete the film um that's how we made that movie how it got seen was was a sort of rather unlikely, you know, Cinderella tale of going to Sundance, it winning the audience award. MTV Films happen, happens to be there. They say we want to distribute it, um, and and then it got distributed. Um, but but a lot of a, a lot of I think the success of that uh, that documentary was just word of mouth. Hmm. And was there a tipping point in that? I know these things too, when you're going through them, they seem a lot less clear than, you know, now we sit, you know, 15 years later knowing the outcome. But was there a tipping point when you're going through this process where you thought, okay, this movie actually is going to get seen. It's going to get seen by a wide audience. That's a great question. Uh, you never know. You, you, as a filmmaker, you have your necessary delusions that keep you going day to day. And those delusions are, <laughs> people are going to see this movie. Yeah. Tell yourself, people are going to see this movie. And if you're in a particularly delusional state, you're like, people are going to see it and love it. And you need that mm -hmm. to keep going. Um, you have to believe in that. Yeah. And, but, and, and of course, the, the other side of that, the other side on the other end is, you know, crickets and heartbreak. Um, and that happened for, for everybody, even, you know, some of the greatest filmmakers who, who thought that they were making masterpieces and then they, they weren't well received. And it, ha it happens for, it's, I think that's just part of the process of being a filmmaker is you need that mm -hmm. delusion. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's talk about that transition. So then you've done a bunch of documentaries. James Mangold is telling you, try and do some narrative, um, some narrative features and stuff. What was that transition like going from, you know, a background in documentary filmmaking with some success behind you and then trying to make that transition into, you know, fictional films? Well, the thing that, br that bridged them both is that after Murder Ball, um, a lot of uh, uh, c commercial production companies, um, um, invited me to join them to, to make commercials. Oh, I see. And, um, and I, I chose to be with a, a company called Smuggler, who um, is a production company that is dedicated to ma making mostly commercials, but we also make lots of PSAs. Um, in fact, um, I love making PSAs. We usually make one or two a year, almost like a, like a law firm does pro bono work. We do PSAs alongside funded commercials to to get you know certain messages out for example the last week i made a, a psa about four of the families in the sandy hook uh the sandy hook uh, foundation which 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 got picked up by a few presidential candidates and retweeted um and that, that was a sort of a message uh about how to spot signs and uh, you know and people who are unstable and might be a threat to you at schools um so i i love i love doing that that was sort of a hybrid documentary fiction piece i loved exploring documentary and fiction and the styles of the merger of, of, of the two like i said earlier um one of my uh, favorite documentaries of all time was errol morris's thin, thin blue line and um and so a lot of the commercials i've made over the years have merged a documentary feel with a fictional narrative whether they are psas or commercials for Adidas or, or, or Gatorade or whatnot. Um, and, and so I thought this, this sort of became my niche. Um, there was one ad that, 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 um, did very well a few years ago, which was just, uh, it was, it was Derek Jeter's last day. 
of playing at the Yankee Stadium. And so we, uh, the uh, advertising agency and I sort of concocted this idea that he would, he would tell his chauffeur to just stop like 10 blocks before Yankee Stadium. And he would hop out and he would just walk like to really enjoy his last walk to Yankee Stadium. And we mm-hmm. shot it kind of like for real. And people flipped out. Huh. They came up to him. They were like, ch- ch- you know, cheering and yelling, cheater, you know. It was a really wonderful mm-hmm. feeling. And that, and that, I end up doing a lot of ads like that, that feel real, even huh. though they're, they're sort of directed as well. Um, and so, so I, I did at least five years of ads uh, before, um, you know, uh, I, I thought, well, maybe I could make a, a fiction movie. You know, I don't know the real rules of fiction, filmmaking, like the reverse shot. The the, the 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 wide shot that establishes everything. I, did, mm-hmm. I, I I'm much more like set up two cameras and shoot because that's where I come from from documentaries. But I applied that to my first narrative film, Disconnect. And if, and if you watch it, you'll see it's very much like 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 free flow, two long lens cameras the whole time. And and like some of my favorite directors, which do some of those, these guys do sort of tend to be more documentarian or more eavesdrop like people, people like, you know, early, early or, or, or Ken Loach. I love his, his movies. I love, um, I, I obviously I love John Cassavetes. A lot of these, or, and, um, another one, Robert Altman. is so someone I admire too. A lot of these, when you watch your movies, they, they seem like to ebb and flow and people talk over each other and it feels kind of real in, in a way in which most movies feel very much like very static and very uh, set up and very lit and very perfect. And I like things that feel a little crooked and misshapen yeah. and a little bit more natural, if that makes any sense. So what was, yeah, no, it does. So what was the process? Did you start to write some screenplays? Did you start to option screenplays? Did you then take them to your agent? Like what is the actual process of going from documentarian to, to director of, you know, a narrative feature? For my first uh, uh, fiction feature, uh, it was called Disconnect. That was that was a guy named Bill Horberg, great producer who had produced um, um, who had produced uh, what was that movie with uh, with uh, with Matt Damon and Jude Law, or Matt Damon. And oh, Gattaca. He done. He, 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 well, no, no, Townsend, Mr. Ripley. Um, he okay. done and. Uh, and and he, so he was a he was an amazing producer who came to me and said, "Hey, I, I've been watching your your sort of quasi documentary fictional work uh, uh, for the past few years in commercials. I I think that this film would benefit from a an eavesdrop quality like that." Um, and so he he came to me with this job with the script and was uh, Bill Harburg and said, "You know, re." It as you see fit. And, uh, Mickey Liddell financed it, and we made this film with some uh, some wonderful uh, sort of ensemble cast: Andrew Riseborough, Jason mm-hmm. Bateman, um, Paula Patton, Alexander Skarsgård, um, Hope Davis, uh, and and it was and it was like sort of like this this documentary about three four different stories that all had to do with our connection or our, our, our relationship rather to technology. Um, and it was, it's it, it sort of, you know, that, that film, I tried to make it feel very much like a, you know, an eavesdropped experience when you watch it, the performances and everything. And, and I would often just ask the cast to, you know, throw the script away and just improvise, uh, you know, on the, on the basis of what was, what was on the page. And I found sometimes much better results that way um, than, than if you just r- read the script perfectly. Um, you know, it's always mm-hmm. about trying to, or what I, I'm always attempting is to try to find truth um, when you're in a very contrived situation because a set is very contrived. You have all these people standing around mm-hmm. and all the lights are aimed a certain direction and, you know, you can, you, you're trying to find in a very contrived atmosphere something truthful, something real, you know, among all that yeah. uh, false falseness, um, and that you know, uh, 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 scripts often when you read them out loud, they sound great, but when you start having actors actually act them out, it just sound like you're watching a TV show. Or something. You're watching something false. So I'm mm-hmm. constantly 
So obstacles in front of me, even if it's like body wipes, like people crossing in front of the camera, you know, uh, when you're on a long lens. Yeah. Remember, you know, movies like The Conversations, constantly body wipes, mm-hmm. like people crossing. For, for one second, you don't see your actors. Like, where are they? Oh, there they are. Um, or like the camera shakes yeah, or the yeah. camera moves to find them, you know, and, and when they stumble over their lines or when they find their lines or when they talk over each other, it just suddenly has a tendency to feel a bit more captured rather than acted, mm-hmm. um, which is just something personally that I like. Yeah, yeah. So let's dig into your latest film, Semper Fi. To start out, maybe you can give us a quick pitch or a log line. What is this film all about? Um, the film is about a, a, a bunch of friends who grew up together and one of them gets in some trouble and gets uh, thrown into jail and they try to figure out how to get him out basically i got you were you ever in the marines i wasn't um my my uh we we had a i have friends who were who were part of first marine recon um tip the spear that went into uh iraq first um, during op- Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, also, my co-writer, Sean Mullen, um, uh, did his, uh, uh, served in the U.S. military. He was an Army captain, uh, artillery captain. And so collaborating with him and being around friends who had been in the service, um, you know, we, we tried to get their voice right, tried to capture their voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where did this idea come from? What was sort of the kernel, the genesis of this this idea? Um, you, you brought up Murderball a long time ago when I was shooting returning war vets at Walter Reed Hospital. I met a few of them and I, I heard a story that became the kernel of this movie. Um, and if you, uh, when you watch this film, you'll see there's a, a whole subplot to this film played by Finn Wittrock which is directly linked to a, a true story that, that, that I heard when I was interviewing folks. So this, this started, this idea started a long time ago. Then about 10 years ago, Sean and I wrote the script, tried to get it made, um, failed, and put it away, put it on a shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The, um, I guess the second was part it of that. something that you guys would was it something you guys would drag out every once in a while and and pitch it to people or it was just sitting on the shelf for those ten years? No, it, it sat on the shelf. Sean and I wrote a, a number of others uh, during that, and and um, the guy that I mentioned earlier, Micah Green, who was now CAA, um, where I was where I am a client. Micah says, "Hey, you know, I met a financier the other day, and." Uh, they were they were asking me about a certain type of movie, and I sent them uh, Semperfy. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I said, of course. Uh-huh. Um, and then t- to our t- to Sean and I, this financer said, "Hey, we love it. We want to make this." So at that point, Sean and I dusted it off. Said, "Okay, we better take a look at this seriously here, and 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 see does it still make sense? Is it still?" feel modern doesn't still feel like a, a story mm-hmm. about all the issues that we were grappling with as a nation 2005 yeah, yeah. and we did a rewrite to to make it a bit more uh, you know to up, upgrade it make it a bit more contemporary but it still grapples with a lot of the same issues that we were dealing with in 2005 it's just we have a bit more hindsight now you know and hopefully the story is 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 timeless hopefully the brother's story is timeless yeah. Yeah, yeah. How can people see Semper Fi? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Yes, it's in selected theaters um, on, on, on October 4th, and it also goes simultaneously to, to I believe, I, I hope I get this right, Amazon Prime and iTunes. For, I think it's it's on, on, online for a certain amount of time. Okay, perfect. What's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't really have. To, I've, I've never, I've never gotten on Twitter. I should. I mean, I, I am on Instagram, just under Henry Alex. Henry Alex is my, my handle on Instagram, and I do post things here and there. Um, but I, I, I really appreciate you giving our movie, uh, you know, any kind of shout out because, as you know, with smaller independent films, it, it's, it's all about, 
you know, whether, you know, one writer or one cinephile, you know, enjoyed it and then speaks to others. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like you said, it's like someone just, you know, handing out or, or it's like, like back when we had, and your and your and your and your guy or your gal that you trust behind the counter is like you gotta see this. Mm-hmm. That's how I used yeah, to watch movies, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. Well, Henry, I really appreciate anymore. you taking some time out. Well, Henry, I really appreciate you taking some time out today to come and talk with me. Good luck with this film, and um, good luck with all your future films as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. I just want to talk quickly about SYS Select. It's a service for screenwriters to help them sell their screenplays and get writing assignments. The first part of the service is the SYS Select screenplay database. Screenwriters upload their screenplays along with a logline, synopsis, and other pertinent information like budget and genre, and then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays they want to produce. Dozens of producers are in the system looking for screenplays right now. There have been a number of success stories come out of the service. You can find out about all the SYS Select successes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. Also on SYS podcast, podcast episode 222, I talk with Steve Deering, who was the first official success story to come out of the SYS Select database. When you join SYS Select, you get access to the screenplay database along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members. These services include the newsletter. This monthly newsletter goes out to a list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in this monthly newsletter. We also provide screenwriting leads. We have partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads services so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These leads run the gamut. There's producers looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. They're looking for shorts, features, TV and web series pilots, all types of projects. Projects. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. Also, you get access to the SYS Select forum where we will help you with your logline and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. We also have a number of screenwriting classes that are recorded and available in the SYS Select forum. These classes, these are all the classes that I've done over the years, so you'll have access to those whenever you want once you join. The classes cover every part of writing your screenplay from concept to outlining to the first act, second act, third act, as well as other topics like writing short films and pitching your projects in person. Once again, if this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that is sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing the writer-director duo Henry Jacobson and Avra Fox Lerner. They just did a film called Bloodline starring Sean William Scott. We'll dig into that film and how it all came together. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.